Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning here at First Baptist Church. Last year on Easter, we had 10 people. In fact, we recorded it in the lobby, but I'm thrilled that you're here. Uh, to those of you who are visiting, make yourself at home. You're among friends. Uh, as someone said earlier, we're not perfect people. And uh, we may be First Baptist Church, but we're just common folk like you, and we're thrilled that you chose our church. Today, I want to invite all of us to take a Bible. Maybe yours is electronic. Maybe it's in book form. Maybe you don't have either. There's a black Bible in front of you. And I'll ask you to join me this Easter Sunday morning, turning to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let me just say, uh, Don, once again, thank you and our music ministry for bringing us to the Lord today on this Easter Sunday. Trust that God's been good to you. I know that God's going to be good to you today as you celebrate uh, his resurrection with family and friends. If you're a note taker like I am, on the back of your worship folder that you received from one of our men when you came in, there's an outline of today's message. I've titled the message, The Resurrection. It matters. So today we come in just a few moments to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll look at the first 19 verses, so will give you time to find that uh, in your New Testament. I have a question to start off the sermon today. Have you ever found yourself saying, I should have taken that more serious? Yeah, I should have taken that more serious. I used to say that every six weeks when report cards came home to our house. I should have taken that more serious. On the flip side, maybe you said, I took that way too serious. I should have taken that lightly. Many people today live a life filled with stress. I mean, everything stresses them out. Their blood pressure is high. Every little situation is serious. Every little thing they literally take seriously, and it makes themselves sick. Every little crisis is an emergency. Every little thing that happens, it's almost as though they call 911 because something's burning down. Now, to those people, we say every now and then, you need to loosen up. You need to lighten up. You need to enjoy life a little bit more. Now, the flip side of that is, is that there are people that never take anything serious. You know anybody like that? I mean, to them, life is a constant joke. They laugh about everything. Nothing stresses them out. They don't get in a hurry for anything. There's no sense of urgency whatsoever in their life. It's just, let's just uh, live life, and what happens will happen, and that's okay. I'm just going to be happy. Now, there are many people in the world today that take that same mindset and they're applying it to what I would call a very serious matter in life. And today, let me take just a second and explain to all of us what I'm talking about. Today in churches all across the world, today in buildings called sanctuaries, auditoriums, maybe even today in some school buildings because churches don't have their own building, all across, not just America, but all across the world, people have gathered or will gather just like you and I to celebrate Easter. Now listen, uh, I'm a preacher that lives in the real world, and I know that a lot of people are here even in early service for multiple reasons. Okay, so I get it. I, I know some of you are here because it's the only way you could get new clothes. I get that. Okay, I know some of you are here because you want to have lunch provided at home when you get home. Guys, I get that. I know. Some of you are here because your parents, like probably my wife and I did to our three girls, made you come. It was non-negotiable. You're going to church, if no other Sunday in the year, on Easter. So I get it. There's a lot of different reasons. And some people come because they really love the Lord Jesus Christ and really want to be here. I get all of that. I understand everything. But by us being here today, whatever the reasoning may be, we're basically saying that we believe the Bible and we recognize the fact that the Bible is proclaiming that Jesus is raised from the dead. Amen. He appeared to a large number of people over a 40-day period. And during that time, he gave convincing proofs of his resurrection and his bodily ascension into heaven. The Bible goes on to confirm, and we're about to read it, the Bible confirms that Jesus Christ really is risen from the dead, and one day he is going to return, and he's going to judge every last one of us. 
Folks, that's serious business. It's not something, in my opinion, to be taken lightly. What you do with the risen Lord Jesus Christ right now determines your eternity. Matthew 16, 26. What does it profit a man, woman, boy, or girl, if they gain the whole world and lose their soul? Have you ever heard that? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but yet loses his soul? And yet most people spend the bulk of their time and efforts to gain the things of this world. We pursue things that perish. We pursue things that fade. We pursue things that we destroy. I'll never forget, and my mother is probably watching on Facebook Live, and I'm going to go to Mesquite and have lunch with her later, but I'll never forget Easter Sunday, fourth grade. I had a brand spanking new leisure suit. Now, those of you who are under the age of 50, ask somebody over 50 what a leisure suit is, and we'll tell you. And it was one of those reversible, two suits in one. You remember that? Man, I was big time. And my parents probably sacrificed. My dad probably worked overtime. Mom did too, so that, so that Scott and Jason Brown, who's also preaching right now in Bernie, Texas, could have Easter clothes. And before we got home from the Gross Road Baptist Church, because I was all boy, and me and a bunch of little boys ran through the church and outside, I had fallen, and I tore both knees out of that brand spanking new from Sears and Roebuck leisure suit. We pursue stuff that won't even last the day. We pursue things that, that make us temporarily happy. Yesterday I read an article. Just understand this. Listen to this. A 28-year-old pitcher in Major League Baseball who's one of the most sought-after relievers went to his manager and said, I'm out. I'm tired of this. It's no longer fun. I've invested all my life. My parents sacrificed, and I'm walking away from Major League Baseball. We pursue things. We take serious those things that don't amount to a hill of beans. If Jesus Christ is truly risen from the grave, it's the most important feat in all of history. Tremendous consequences, my friend, hinge upon the response that you and I will make as it relates to the resurrection. Our passage of Scripture today proves the resurrection. Now, I know that in our world today, there are a bunch of naysayers. In fact, the latest research that came out Friday, for the first time in the history of America, less than 50% of Americans worship at a church. 47% of Americans worship. The first time in history of this great nation, it's been below 50%. So I know today that in the world, maybe even here, maybe even in the small town of Bullard, Texas, there are some people that really just don't get it. They don't believe this. And so today from your Bible, I want to try as best I can as your friend, as the pastor of this great church, I want to be as true to the Word of God as I may be to let you know that the resurrection, it truly matters. If you have your Bible, look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the first 19 verses. The Apostle Paul wrote these words. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and now which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you believed in vain. Verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. In other words, they passed on. Then he appeared to James and all the apostles. Lest of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whatever then it was, I or they, so we preached as you believed. Verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, 
How can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? But there's no resurrection of the dead. Then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. That means empty. And your faith is in vain. That means empty. We're even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he, was, that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. Verse 18. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. Then if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who are asleep, fallen asleep in Christ, have perished. And if, if in Christ we have hope, in this life only, we are all people most to be pitied. I want to make some observations today to support the fact that the resurrection matters. And what you do with the resurrection today affects your life for all of eternity. It really does. And so I want us to see right from this passage of Scripture, I'm not making this stuff up. That's why I ask you to take a Bible, a source of Scripture. I want you to see the truth of God's Word. And I want to start as I look at the first 11 verses, and I want to say today that the resurrection matters because it is true. Now, the resurrection of Jesus isn't some religious myth. It's not something we do every springtime to make us feel good about the sun being out and the flowers and the trees blooming. It doesn't, it's not just something to feel good to make us get ready for the summer. If that's the case, the resurrection stunk last year, amen? Yeah, because it did just the opposite if we were thinking that way. There was nothing joyful about last year's Easter worldly-wise. We were all hemmed up in our house, couldn't get out, couldn't go to school, couldn't go to work. And so it's not just some religious myth. It actually, there was a bodily, not just spiritual, but a bodily resurrection from the dead. It was a physical body that could be seen, that if need to be, could have been touched, that breathed breath, that drank fluid, and that even ate. It was a resurrected body. There are people in our society today who say, now Scott, and to you people, if you want to believe in the resurrection, that's okay. You go right ahead, whatever floats your boat. Whatever makes you feel good. But as for me, I don't believe it at all. I'm not concerned about the resurrection. Now, those people don't get it. If that's you, you don't understand. Because the resurrection is true. It's not just true for some and untrue for the others. It's true for all. It's like the law of gravity. Gravity is gravity whether Scott Brown believes in it or not. Would you agree with that? It's going to happen. Gravity is gravity, whether I believe or I check out on it. It's true. It's the law of gravity. And so some of us may not believe gravity, but it really is a principle. It really is a fact. And you hope it's true if you decide to go somewhere and jump off a cliff. You hope that gravity is really gravity. And so there's some people that say, Scott, you and all those church people, you go and believe in the resur resurrection if you want to, but I'm out. I don't believe it. Listen. It's not an either or. It's a fact of life. The resurrection did happen. And the way you deal with it today affects your eternity forever. And the last time I looked at the word eternity, that means forever, non-ending. So how do we know the resurrection that we just read about? How do we know that it wasn't false? How do we know that a bunch of Jesus cronies just didn't get together and they formulated this plan? They just thought, you know what, we're going to see if this stuff sells through the centuries. How do we know that it's real? Well, look in verse 4. I'm glad you ask. <laughs> we know it's real through the evidences, according to Paul, of prophetic scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with what? What's your Bible say? Scripture. Not Scott Brown's opinion, but Scripture. And there's evidence of prophetic scriptures. You go to the Old Testament, you start with the book of Leviticus, you journey to, to Psalms, and you even look at the book of Isaiah. Come into the New Testament, look at the book of Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews. That's just a few of the books of the Bible that indicate that Jesus Christ was going to and did raise, he was raised up from the grave. It's a matter of prophetic truth. Scriptures, folks, are accurate upon hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prophecies of the Old Testament. It's not a story 
that a bunch of dejected disciples got together and decided to ride up after Jesus was crucified. So we know the resurrection is true because, as Paul says, because of the evidences of the prophetic scriptures. But also look at verse 5 through 8. He talks about the evidences of eyewitness testimony. Eyewitness testimony. You've been following any trials lately? Have you been listening to what's going on in a courtroom anywhere in America? Yeah, we all have. There are cities bracing for outcomes of a major trial. And I can assure you the reason it's taken so long for cases to get to trial is because the defense or the prosecutor, they're looking not for hearsay, they're looking for what? Eyewitness testimonies. They're not going to put some Yahoo on the stand who doesn't really know what they're talking about. They're not going to put somebody on the stand that said, you know what, I don't think that really happened after all. No, that would destroy their case. And so Paul is talking, look at your text. Look at how many people, over 500 people with their own eyeballs, not hearsay, not Facebook, not Snapchat, not Instagram, not Twitter, whatever else is out there. They saw the risen Lord Jesus Christ in a 40-day period with their own eyes. They took nobody's word for it. They saw themselves, the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And so the resurrection is fact. Whether you want to believe it or not, it's fact because of prophetic scriptures and eyewitness testimony. But then look at verse 9 through 11. I think it's a fact because of lives that were changed. Look what Paul said about himself. He mentions his own transformation. Because he said in verse 9, because I persecuted the church of God. Now, for those of you that aren't biblical-minded or biblical scholars or don't read the Bible much, let me just tell you that Paul, single-handedly, before salvation and faith in Christ, tried his best to destroy the church. If you were a Christian, he'd burn you at the stake. If you were a Christian, he didn't care. He tried to snuff out your life. And Paul said, because I have experienced this risen Lord Jesus Christ, the life that I used to live of destroying the cause of Christ, it's changed my life. It's made a difference in who I am. We also know that Peter and the other apostles were transformed. They were depressed men. But Jesus Christ came back and literally transformed their life. How about you? How about me? For those of us that profess faith in Christ, are we living a testimony of a life that's changed? Are we? Can people see Jesus through us? Friday night when probably 500 to 1,000 people gathered at our church, many of whom I'm sure were unchurched, could they see something different in us other than just a blue shirt that said doing life together? Could they? You see, my life has changed. When I was nine years old, I acknowledged the fact that even though my parents were godly, even though I was drugged to church every Sunday, Sunday night and Wednesday night back in the day, that I needed a Savior. And Jesus radically transformed my life. And if you're here today and you're a Christian, the Word of God is true. The resurrection matters because when we look at your life, there's evidence of changed lives. Folks, the evidence of the fact that the resurrection is true is solid. It's proven. And we must begin by realizing that the resurrection matters because it is a historical fact. Therefore, we've got to take it seriously. Amen. Now, with your Bible still open, I want us to look at verse 12 through 19 because I believe the resurrection matters because without it, Christianity is worthless. Listen, if Jesus didn't raise, rise up from the grave... You and I have wasted our Sunday morning. Just saying. If he didn't rise up from the grave, we ought to take all our clothes back tomorrow and ask for a refund. Because we didn't need them. I I'm just saying. And, and so the Word of God says that the resurrection matters because without it, Christianity is worthless. The Corinthians were not rejecting the resurrection per se, but they had never heard of anything like this. They'd never seen anything like this. There was no logical explanation for what they were seeing. In fact, Paul was even shocked that it happened. 
Paul was completely caught off guard. Have you ever been uh, somewhere or something happened in your life and you were shocked that it happened? I love these videos or these stories where our men and women who are in service, where they come back home and they usually stage an event at a ball field or at a, at, at a school where they walk into their children or their spouse and they're completely blown away. Doesn't that just make you feel good? I mean, they weren't expecting it. As a parent who all three daughters now live away from home, sometimes they don't tell the truth to their mom and dad. They lie to the preacher, and they just all show up unexpected, and we're thrilled that they're there. We overlook the line. There are times where your kids do something, your spouse does something, your boss does something. How many of you were shocked at maybe at Christmas time because the owner of your business brought you a Christmas bonus and you thought, there's no way of this year we're getting a Christmas bonus as bad as it's been. And you were shocked. You were completely caught off guard. And Paul was that guy. What those people saw, they couldn't explain. They were caught off base. The resurrection matters because without it, Christianity is worthless. Look at verse 14. The gospel is worthless if Jesus doesn't raise from the dead, rise from the dead. Our preaching, Paul says, look at it, it's in vain. Our lives are in vain. There's no substance to the gospel if Jesus has not been raised from the dead. Christianity has some nice moral compasses and characteristics, but if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, Christianity is just a stale, traditional religion like so many others. There's nothing that sets it apart. What sets our faith apart is that we serve a king who rose from the grave. All the rest of the people worship somebody that's still dead as a doornail and in the grave. And so, the resurrection. We've got to believe it. If it's not true, the gospel is worthless. Therefore, believing the gospel is worthless. Listen, if these people that wrote in here, if these people that spoke, if these people, if it didn't really happen, they're a bunch of liars. They've deceived a ton of people. Nobody likes a liar. Nobody likes somebody that deceives other people. Believing the gospel would be worthless if Jesus Christ truly didn't come back from the grave. Now, you can believe whatever you want to. You can believe that Bigfoot has been spotted in the state of Oklahoma if you want to. Ask my son-in-law about that a few weeks ago. Where, there? Where is he? You can believe that if you want to, but your faith is only as strong in what you believe in. Your faith is only as good as the object in which you place it in. If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then his death is no different than any other death. If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, there's no hope beyond the grave. Now, I want you to listen to me closely here, okay? Some of you may not come back, so I want you to leave understanding what I'm saying. We've become a society that believes God's just a smidge better than we are. And that it's all on us and that we're good enough. We might need a boost from him every once in a while to make it. If Christianity is not true, there's no hope beyond the grave. If, if Jesus didn't conquer the grave, for those of us, including me and my family, who have lost loved ones to death, they're just as dead as everybody who didn't know Jesus. And in fact, listen to what 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 and 14 says. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So if Jesus, here's what it means. If Jesus didn't conquer death, if Jesus didn't rise from the grave, when our loved ones die, they're as dead as everybody else. One of the most challenging things that I have to do as a pastor is to do a funeral for somebody who's unchurched. And let me just tell you, there are more and more calls for that more than ever before. There are many more calls from families or funeral homes and they say, hey, Brother Scott, so-and-so lost a loved one. They're not church people. They don't have a pastor. Would you come do their funeral? My answer is always yes, because that family needs ministered to. It's not to promote me. It's not to promote First Baptist Board. It's to minister a family. And when I sit with those families, when I talk to them, when I go to the visitation, and I'll ask them, 
can you tell me about so-and-so's walk with Christ? Can you tell me about their spiritual life? And more often than not, I, I get this answer. Man, they were good people. They worked hard. He provided for his family. Man, she was a great wife. That kid was a solid kid. I don't ever hear people say, you know what? They really were a strong believer. But I often hear, they were good folk. And boy, heaven's a better place today because they're there. Folks, that is completely opposite of the teaching of the Word of God as anything I've ever heard. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's a gift of works, not, not of, it's a gift of grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, when your day comes and you die, you'll be dead just like those who don't know Christ. But for those of us who have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we're just asleep and we have hope. It's much easier to do a funeral for somebody that's walked with Jesus Christ, that is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, because I can share this passage of Scripture and others, and I can look at that family seated in the family section, and I can say, but for those of us who know Jesus, we have hope that one day we'll be reunited with Him. And so the resurrection of Jesus Christ it matters. It matters because it gives us hope beyond the grave. Nothing is farther from the truth. The only reason that Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary is so that you and I could be made righteous, so that we could be justified, so that we could receive His grace. If Jesus Christ isn't risen, dear friends, the gospel of Jesus Christ is worthless. If Jesus Christ hasn't risen from the grave, i got to get a real job. If Jesus Christ is not risen from the grave, your suffering is worthless. Look at verse 19, would you? Paul talks about suffering. Too many Christian people today say they believe in Jesus and the resurrection, yet when they do an honest examination and evaluation of their lifestyle, that's not true at all. There are people today, not all, thank the Lord, but there are a lot of people today who profess faith in Jesus Christ, but they're just in it for comfort for affluence, for personal comfort, for goals in life to be met. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, if it wasn't so, your suffering would be worthless. If we truly, biblically seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, we're going to suffer. If someone led you to faith in Jesus Christ, someone's been your pastor, someone's been your Bible study teacher or discipled you, and they've told you that the Christian life is a bed of roses, they have not been honest with you. And I dare say that it's not going to become more challenging in the days ahead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the sure evidence that what he taught is true. It is the central fact of all of history. It is the base for our life. The resurrection of Jesus Christ matters. Apart from it, the Christian life is worthless. When I was a kid growing up, one of my favorite game shows on television was Let's Make a Deal. Do you remember that? In fact, it's back on. Now, it's not near as good as it was years ago. Let's Make a Deal. Those people would dress up crazy, crazy. And they would get chosen, their name called out, and Monty Hall would have them there. And he always had this stand, and on that stand was a prize. And, and then there were three or four curtains behind him, and, and, and he would say, now you can take this prize here, and then they would lift the box lid, and you could see what it was. Maybe it was a, back in the day a new record player or you know, something like that, a new mixer. Whew, that's big time, wouldn't it? You, you could take what you could visibly see, or you could, you could give it up for what was behind curtain number one, two, or three, or four. And, and sometimes those people, they wouldn't take the visible. They would go for the invisible. And that curtain would go up, and there'd be a, just an old worn-out piece of furniture. I remember one time a donkey. I, I guess people need a donkey, but I mean, Really? One time there was 10,000 boxes of matches, I'll never forget. They were stacked everywhere. And, and so somebody gave up a nice something here for 10,000 boxes of matches. Why do you do that? And I was reminded that sometimes people will give up the visible 
the nice thing, and they'll take a chance on the curtain. And, and sometimes they would give that up and get something better. Sometimes they would take that and lose something of great value. And I thought to myself, a lot of people today are just like that. We want to take what's visible right now, but we give up what's worth so much more when it comes to eternity. The resurrection of Jesus Christ matters. And what you and you and you and you and me do with it today affects our life for all of eternity. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is fact. Whether you believe it or not, it really did happen. And, and let me just go on record as saying, for those of you here and those watching on Facebook, if you reject Jesus Christ and then you, you pass away without Christ, you're going to realize then that it was real. And it's too late. It's too late. The resurrection it matters. It's worth taking it very serious. It's a very serious matter that you need to examine and digest and consider. Because the way you deal with it today affects your life forever. But a lot of times what happens is we don't take the resurrection seriously. We take all the other things that we can see seriously. And they fade. They die. We lose them. We tear them up. We outgrow them. And then they're of no value anymore. We don't care about them. So today, this morning on Easter Sunday, when we're all together in the first service, can I encourage you, can I plead with you, all of you, would you take seriously the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Don't laugh it off. Don't slough it off. In fact, let me just encourage you not to even consider putting it off. I know a lot of times we're young, we're healthy, we're vibrant. Brother Scott, I'll, I'll deal with that later. I want to do what I want to do right now. There's too many people that could say to us today, and their life is a testimony, don't take that attitude. I remember the first time that one of my best friends died. He was just 19 years old. And he didn't die in a car crash. He didn't overdose on drugs. He was simply blocking at Howard Payne University for an extra point on the football field at Gordon Wood Stadium. For the first time in my life, I saw death take a young person's life. Folks, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't put it off till tomorrow. Your life's but a vapor. It appears for a short time and vanishes away. You may not get a chance a few years from now. I want to encourage you today as you prepare in just a few moments to leave this building, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, whether you're a member of this church or some other church, whether you came today for the right reasons or you came just to please somebody, I want to ask you today, would you seriously consider the fact that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true? Because that decision affects your eternity. Let's pray together.